Let's talk about it. What causes bloating? Because it's very uncomfortable. A lot of people come in and they have bloating and they're worried it might be a cancer. And sometimes, you know, we do worry about that. But I think generally, what's the more common things that you see that cause bloating? Yeah. So, you know, one of the most common things, obviously, for bloating is the fibrous foods that you're eating, right? A lot of people are like, you know what? I'm going to eat that salad. I'm going to eat broccoli and asparagus because I've heard all over the internet that I need to have high fiber food. So people start introducing it. They're like, oh, well, it makes me bloated. Well, yeah, those are non-digested, you know, plant sugars. And because they're not digested, they ferment. And, it, you know, takes place in the second portion of the small intestine. So now it's got to travel through. And before it travels through, it kind of makes you bloat. Okay. The other thing is that you can have something called a visceral hypersensitivity. Again, like we talked about, that stress is then um, giving signals through the nerves, the, the vagus nerve, down to the nerves in your GI tract that says, okay, well, we are in a state of stress. We need to either accommodate by making room because we're not sure when we're going to eat. So we're going to make a lot of room so we can have a lot more food. Or we're going to start rumbling and pushing everything through as quick as possible. And that can cause bloating. So sometimes out of nowhere, it can happen as well. So it's called visceral hypersensitivity. It can be a bacteria. Right? There is a bacteria called H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, that is very prevalent in some countries. And now it's all over the world, truly, because we, you can get it from anywhere, from foods, from utensils, from one another. And you know, when ingested through foods over time, it can cause ulcers, but it can certainly cause bloating and gastritis. And so sometimes it can be bacteria. Other times it can just be an overgrowth of the bad bacteria. You've taken an antibiotic and wiped out so many things because you had a cold or you had an infection and now you have a lot of bad bacteria that's fermenting in there and causing that bloating. That's why you should never take antibiotics unless you absolutely need them. Yes. So yes. I'm a huge yes. proponent because I see tons of women and men, but mo more women than men who've had recurrent urinary tract infections and they're not really urinary tract infections or they, you know, they haven't been treated appropriately. And so they've been on like 10 or 15 courses of antibiotics and yep. that will completely wipe out all the good bacteria in your bladder and your gut everywhere else. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, people think like, oh, I, I'm doing myself a favor. No, it, it's actually altering it to, you know, having deleterious effects. So, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we did talk a little bit about constipation with kiwi helping and prunes helping. You know, people want to know what causes constipation and what can we do to prevent it or, or get better? So constipation is really, you know, I say it's multifactorial. You know, people just think it's just slow moving bowels, but there's so much more to constipation than just slow moving bowels. It can be that, right? Because maybe you just haven't had enough fiber or you're on certain medications, whether it's magnesium or calcium supplementation that can slow it down. If you're on iron supplementation, that can make you constipated. If you have diabetes, okay, or are taking one of the new medications for weight loss or diabetes, like Ozempic, that actually slows down how your intestines empty. So that can cause constipation. So that's one form. There is something called IBS type C, so irritable bowel syndrome, that's constipation predominant. And that's the one where your body re reacts to the underlying stressors that it's feeling and says, okay, we are in a, you know, a low state of fight or flight, and we are going to hold all of our contents in until we are in a state of freedom where we can go to our toilet in peace and let it out. And you'll often, often see like patient, my patients come in, they're like, I traveled to France for a business trip and the entire four days that I was there, I didn't use a single toilet in Paris. And I'm like, wow, that's terrible. They are really nice bidets there. And, <laughs> and they, I was like, you didn't even use one once? And they're like, no, I, but as soon as I got home, I let it all out and four days worth of stool came out. I'm like, my God, that American toilet had it all. So, you know, and that's a, you know, very classic form of IBS type C and that's a stress mediated. And then last but not least, there is pelvic floor dysfunction. And these can all overlap, by the way, but pelvic floor dysfunction, you have something like childbirth or surgery or trauma, sexual trauma or stress or stress that where your muscles just don't necessarily want to coordinate with each other and allow for that poop to come out naturally. And so that it's almost fighting the urge to come out. And so, and then one other, you know, set of muscles is like, okay, let, let's just stay in, let's just stay closed. Let's not let it out. And so they're kind of, you know, not working together. And so you get pelvic floor dysfunction over time. So the three can overlap. You can have them simultaneously separately, but there's all different reasons for why you can have constipation. Yeah. 
You mentioned magnesium. So people sometimes take magnesium for mm-hmm. constipation. Which type of magnesium? I mean, you go to the supermarket, right? There's like four different types of magnesium. Some are better for sleep. Some are better for bowels. Some are better for whatever. So what do you recommend? So magnesium oxide and magnesium citrate are the best ones in terms of constipation. One of the newer studies recently showed that magnesium oxide can be one of your first go-to over-the-counter therapies for when you are, you know, about run-of-the-mill constipated because it's it's easy, effective. Do have to be careful if you've got an issue with your kidneys and that are not working as well, but that's one of the first things you can kind of turn to over the counter. So food, fiber, magnesium, what else are some easy things people can do at home to help with constipation? Water. Water, water, water. We don't get enough water in our day. You know, the first things often we wake up and we're like, okay, coffee, I need to open my eyes. I need to get ready because I didn't get enough sleep. And so let me, you know, chug that Starbucks first. Water. Start with water first, because if you can get enough water into your system around 64 to 100 ounces a day, then you can also have enough things absorbed into your actual, you know, stool and allow for it to kind of move through your body. So is it true that what coffee helps you go, right? Like, is that something like people like, oh, I need my cup of coffee or I won't poop? Or is it just the fluid that's actually making them go? A little bit of both. So hot coffee actually can stimulate the bowels, so as can hot water. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the hot coffee itself. But coffee has caffeine, which also stimulates your bowels to move. So again, it's the two in combination that a lot of people need in order to kind of stimulate the peristalsis or muscle muscle movement in the colon to have that bowel movement. But that's so interesting because even in Indian culture, right, people drink hot water in the morning. Yes, yes. And maybe that's part of the reason. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, people have fennel water, hot water, lemon water. All those things are things that stimulate colonic contractions. And so they, they've got something, you know, in that in, uh, based on science. Yeah. So if you're trying to avoid coffee in the morning or limit your caffeine, I encourage you to try some hot water. Yeah, or absolutely. Some de- or some like herbal tea, which is warm that doesn't have the caffeine because that yes. may be helpful. Yeah. And even black coffee, it's got chlorogenic acid in it. It's helpful for the cells in your colon as well. So what about movement? Movement helps with constipation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, moving your body will move your bowels mm-hmm. for sure. So getting 20 to 30 minutes of, you know, aerobic exercise per day will, one, help that good bacteria start to ferment. And helping that good bacteria start to ferment will help make more serotonin. Serotonin, our happy hormone, also modulates how we empty our bowels. So it'll help keep things flowing as well. Man, are these little bacteria are so sensitive. It's so sensitive. <laughs> no matter how tough you think you are, your bacteria still need you to do all the right things. 100. Yeah. <laughs> so- 